Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Light Zone Data Show. My name is George Firikan, and today I'm very excited to talk about the future of work using predictive models in HR analytics. And to do so, we have Keith Good, who's the Vice President of Zeroed In. Keith, welcome to the Light Zone Data Show. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And I'm so excited to address this topic. I feel like it's really on top of mind on a lot of companies. And I want to first get an overview of the predictive models in HR analytics and kind of the significance that you're seeing that they are shaping the future of our work. Great. Yeah, I'd like to start by kind of identifying two main areas. One, advances in, in machine learning and, and AI um, really is being uh, provided some algorithms that can address key concerns from an HR perspective, like flight risk and hiring models and so forth. And the second is a little bit more, shall we say, old schoolish, where you know, organizing data, getting data prepared for uh, introduction into a, a model. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, both areas require a level of effort. Um, and it's great that these models are, are becoming a lot more easy to, to use and work with. However, there's still some challenges out there to, to be able to get data prepared for a model. And then of course, the other challenge and, and level of effort comes into understanding what a model generates and how it could be used. Right, right. And, and we'll talk about that as well. I'll, I have a, a couple of questions on it, but I'm, I'm very curious really from the experience that I'm having, not that I'm in HR, but you know, um, mm -hmm. obviously as an employee, I do interact with HR and I feel like a lot of companies in HR, they're having hurdles with workforce planning, with talent acquisition, with that employee retention that you're also mentioning. So how would predictive models contribute to improving these HR hurdles? Absolutely. And a lot of different ways. Uh, from that recruitment perspective, it's it's analyzing and utilizing that historical data uh, about your the candidates that, that have come through the front door, those that have been acquired or hired, as well as those that have been not. And of course, looking at long term to see who's worked out and who hasn't. So the challenge right there is you know looking at pulling data from two disparate siloed systems bring it together so that's a the first key challenge but once you get that together you can look at those those candidates and ones that have become hired and successful hired and generate that through a model to help identify what are those components that can be used to help predict what is going to be a good hire and what isn't going to be a good hire, especially across job uh, job skills and organization, even location could be a, a feature that goes into the model to help identify who might be uh, better candidates. Um, so that's one aspect. Another aspect, again, is, is looking at uh, potential who might be at risk of leaving the organization or a flight risk. And we generated models using historical data, um, you know, preparing the data so that you can look at an individual person and maybe counting how many times they've been promoted or demoted or changed jobs or how many supervisors they have. All those are features uh, or factors that go into the model that can then help predict, you know, who might be at risk and, and who might not be. Mm. So um, those are two examples. Um, we've also looked at generating models to help work in general. We've worked with call centers that had very specific skill sets and certifications so that when work came in, it had to be divvied up to, to the right people. So we, we looked at models that would score the work coming in and align it to uh, people's availability um, and certifications that could work on specific uh, tasks that came in. So a lot of great ways that, that AI can be used in helping um, the, the workforce become better utilized. For sure. So I have to ask, especially on the talent acquisition strategy and model, you know, there was this really great example that keeps getting cited from Amazon on how a few years ago they've implemented this AI model to, you know, scour the vast um, number of resumes that they had in the past. And then the, based on that data that it used for training, it then applied to try and hire new employees for, uh, I think, software programmer roles or something like that. And it found out that it had quite a bit of bias. Why? Because at least traditionally, a lot more men used to be hired for those type of roles. So then when the AI algorithm saw that, oh, it looks like there is a woman that's applying instead, 
it was downgrading the value of that resume, not considering it for the, the, the job at hand. So how do you ensure that there's like all these biases and ethical aspects kind of embedded in the work that you do? Yeah, that, that's a really great point. And in fact, you know, taking that a step further, there are some locations, some states, for example, in the state of New York, where they've actually uh, have new legislation that says if you're using AI for human uh, workforce type things like recruiting and others, promotions or whatever, you have to audit to ensure the biases are, are removed. Mm. So, you know, not only is it a, a good thing to do, uh, but it's also in some state a uh, legal requirement to do, um, which I think is fascinating. But, you know, biased uh, analysis is critical in you know, once you generate a model and you're evaluating that model for effectiveness, um, you also want to be able to do a level of, of bias analysis to ensure that the, the model will, will fit what you're trying to do. Um, and, you know, we, we think that it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a legal element, but it is a uh, good and a practice to follow when generating models. So looking at, you know, the features that go into the model, and, and seeing if there's any bias, especially on uh, personal factors such as gender or ethnicity are, are things that should be considered when doing your bias analysis. And I'm curious, usually um, is HR in the loop, is like the human in the loop or are mainly data scientists that are kind of overseeing this? Uh, when you're working with companies, question. do, you, yeah, do yeah. you work closely with the HR? Um, yeah, department. absolutely. So I think in a lot of people, a lot of organizations, sometimes, you know, a, a request will come in to a data scientist that says, we want to generate a model that does this. And and then, you know, a month, two or three months later, you get this back. And, and um, that's a challenge. One, reading it and then understanding, you know, everything that goes into it. So I, I believe to be successful, having that business and HR element and understanding that model is critical throughout the whole process, not just throwing it over the fence for um, a statistician to do, but in that whole process of uh, you know, building out the model, identifying the features that go into it, uh, the bias analysis, and then finally presenting the, the outcome. I mean, you know, most models will, will generate a, a predictive value that's between say zero and one. Well, you don't want to present that to, to a, a a manager, you want to then segment that into something more readable. You know, is it a high flight risk, a medium flight risk, a low flight risk? So you have to, you know, then take those numbers and translate it into something that's more meaningful and displayable. Not only that, we, we've worked with something we call explainable AI. So at the uh, end of the model, you get this prediction, okay, this person's a high flight risk, medium or low, whatever it might be. And then our clients would all often ask, well, you know, why? Why is, you know, Johnny over here a high flight risk, but Susie over there is not? And with AI, the advantage is that it looks at every case and it's able to learn across your data model to make a better prediction. So um, each feature that goes into it could be weighted differently for each prediction. So we're able to then take a prediction and run it back through the model to say, okay, for this prediction, what were the features that were most highly used in generating the prediction? And then you can do that on, on each individual to help understand, you know, why was this person rated a certain way and another person wasn't? So having that explainable AI is really important. And that gets back to your question in terms of, you know, having the people in HR to be able to understand, you know, from a statistician perspective, you might just say, you know, column A was a lot higher than column B, but it takes someone with that business knowledge to say, oh, okay, well, yeah, I see this pay pay increase definitely uh, impacted their ability to stay, hmm. where, you know, a, a numbers person is just looking at it from a number perspective. Right. So one of the other challenges that I'm thinking of in implementing this in certain companies is that they don't have the data necessary to be able to then um, build these models on top of that data. How, how do you work with that? Or do you just work with companies that are maybe at a more mature uh, stage in their, their data, HR data practices? Uh, well, you'd actually be 
be surprised. You know, um, even some of the more mature organizations, it's not always not having the data. It, a lot of times it's the data is spread across different places and it's hard to bring it together. Right. For example, a normal organization in the course of, you know, five to 10 years, they have, may have switched their payroll system twice. They may have introduced two new learning management systems. They may have uh, a different performance management system across that, that time period. So the data is siloed, not only in different systems, but within that silo, maybe even, you know, different systems over time. So mm -hmm. being able to, uh, one, if, if the data is there and it's siloed like that, you have to aggregate it. If the data is just, you know, you're talking about a new organization um, that doesn't have the historical aspect of it, you know, there are, there are other aspects, you know, you could look at Bureau of Labor Statistics and, and others to generate some, some background data. Um, but really you, you do, you know, to have a model that is um, designed for your organization, it really should come from that historical data. Right. Do you also work with unstructured data? I would assume maybe from the resumes, from the applications. Yeah. And also, you know, unstructured data, especially from a uh, surveying perspective, you know, you look at systems like payroll and HRS systems, you can come up with a lot of quantitative information, but, you know, pulling that qualitative information from surveys and being able to do sentiment analysis over top of that and drive that mm -hmm. into a model is, is important as well. So, yeah, we're looking at some of the unstructured data as well um, to, to go into a model. Uh, I have to admit, most of our experience is, you know, first utilizing that more structured quantitative information. Thank you. Can, can you please share some real world examples or success stories that you had where these predictive analytics models have led to, you know, some tangible improvements in the HR processes and outcomes. And you touched upon the call center. Are there any yeah. other ones that come to mind? Yeah, that, that one was was pretty interesting, you know, being able to steer work to to people that were both available and qualified to do the work was was a really nice uh, project. Another example I would come back with is is flight risk. And, and we work with a large retail organization and, um, you know, in the retail space, typically what you may have had to do is, you know, you look at your your employees at, the, say, the store or out in the retail where their, um, their tenure cycle is a lot different than, say, the back office uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, the, the distribution organization. But when you use machine learning, it's able to look at those features that go into a model and determine, you know, what elements are going to be the best to come up with that prediction, where in the past, it would have required you to generate multiple models for those different segments. Um, and that was a, a, a that saves in you know, the number of models that you have to create and maintain um, and a much better result. And it was surprising that when we combined that data into one model, that the model knew, oh, okay, you know, this person I'm evaluating differently because they're back office and, you know, their, their tenure cycle is going to be different than, say, a field store operator or store manager, um, which, you know, often has a much different cycle. So the AI models, it's amazing how it's able to look at those features and then, you know, drive a prediction based off of it. It's, it's fascinating. And it saves on you know time and, and maintenance of, of supporting a model. Absolutely. So what is that process, Keith? As let's say you have an engagement with uh, the organization, you first, I guess, agree on the scope, and then let's say you've already dealt with that data integration hurdle. What's next? Yeah. So uh, you know you you pretty much broken down the, the first part pretty pretty well. I mean, I I would say that there's that that business case that you you start out with to understand you know not just the data that you're going to use, but how are you going to use that, that output? And sometimes I almost, you know, work with people to challenge them and say, you know, upfront, look at possible ways to, to stop and move on to something else. Because, you know, you're in, you're going into a, 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 a difficult and a, um, a process that's going to be somewhat challenging. So make sure upfront, you know, you have a good outcome mm. and, and a, a, a good way you're going to value this. So, to answer your question, you're really now talking. You've done that that business aspect. You've gotten some some data together. You want to go through that that model generation. Um, you know, it, it's finding um, good platforms like R or Python to be able to, to to work with, and of course, good models. And there's a lot of um, algorithms out there 
uh, that are open source that you can work with. Um, you know, it just requires you to get your data prepared. Typically, you know, if you're looking at employee records, you want one employee record that, that sums up things over time like the number of jobs they held, the promotion to motions, the, the average pay over time, um, things like that, so that you have that, that one record to go into that model with the final outcome that you're looking for. Did they stay or did they go? Were they a good hire or were they not a good hire? So it's gonna take that information and, and then generate a prediction. And then you compare that prediction to your actual data set to see, was this a good prediction? Did it match what actually happened? And then when, you know, if it does it, if it's in a, a, a close range, you can use that model again for another set of population. Um, and you're, you can be fairly confident that that, that prediction is, is going to be accurate. So um, that's kind of the, the, the process of building that model and validating it. Um, of course, then looking for any types of biases that we talked about before. Um, and then finally taking that and then taking that prediction and, and mapping it to something that's readable and displayed into reports or dashboards that, that users can, can then gain access to. Um, those are, you know, if you do all that work and you can't get that information out to people that are gonna be able to utilize it, you know, that's re keeping that in the back of mind mm -hmm. in terms of when you're going into it is really important. And ongoing, who's maintaining that? Who's maybe having a review every now, uh, yeah, once in a while to kind of see if everything's still on track, do we need to, maybe put in new data in, uh, feed it like a new data source, making sure that it's still working the way that we uh, thought it was working initially. Yeah, George, I can see you, you've, you've done this before. You've, you've seen that. So obviously, <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's key. Um, you know, from a user ability perspective, you're looking at your field managers and your HRBPs out there that are using this data. Um, typically in our process, in our experience, we're seeing that the, Retraining of a model um, is typically done uh, yearly or twice yearly. So, so you're regathering that data again, retraining the model. Um, and that's just something that's built into the maintenance of, of your model. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be similar types of people that were used to, to initially generate the model. The only difference is you're getting a new data set, running it through the model and analyzing it to make sure it's valid and, and for biases. So the amount of time is a lot different than that initial setup of the model. Right. Um, and it's usually within the HR or uh, HR using a, a vendor to help support that. Thank you. So do you have any advice for organizations in the HR departments looking to adopt these predictive models? What best practices would you offer to ensure that successful implementation and successful utilization? Yeah, I do. I, I think, again, it starts with, you know, understanding how, you know, if you could wave that magic wand and automatically you had this prediction, how are you going to use that? How are you going to display it? And how are you going to get it out to the people? Because if there isn't that foundation, or if there isn't that process uh, built in, then mm -hmm. I would say, okay, move on to something else. But, you know, thinking about what that, that final, um, output is going to look like and how it's going to add value to organization. If it's not adding value, move on to something else. So that I would say is probably key. Um, and then second is be ready for a little bit of a challenge to, to get data and get data prepared. Um, again, it's siloed. It's across different systems. You're going to have to bring that together. And that's a little bit of a lift. Uh, and then thirdly, I think the model generation and the model aspect, there is a lot of help out there. There's a lot of great um, open source out there. Um, there's people that can help you with that. Um, so often people think that's the primary challenge. And I think that that challenge is actually becoming a, a minimal, you know, working with vendors, working with open source, um, that challenge can, can actually get smaller. It says other things afterwards, I think people need to understand. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that because then it seems that the future is more attainable and it's actually here. We can yeah. do that now. Yep. Well, thank you so Absolutely. much, Keith, for being the Lights and Data Show and putting the lights on the future of work, predictive models in HR analytics. I do encourage people to follow Keith Good on LinkedIn and check out uh, Zero It In. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always happy, as you can tell, to carry on this conversation. I think there's a lot of value that can be gained. And my, my handle on LinkedIn is Keith A. Good. So feel free to reach out. I'd love to, to carry on the conversation. 
Thank you so much, Keith. That's very generous. Thanks, George.